fun. Uh, my name is Michael Kavna with the Washington Post. I'm a cartoonist and a comic riffs blogger. And uh, it, part of the pleasure of my job of doing this, this blog for the last seven years after being a syndicated cartoonist was uh, to be an animation geek, an animation expert, no, an animation whore is what I would call myself. Because the first thing I did as soon as I got the gig, I, I journalistically speaking, uh, slept with uh, John Lasseter and Io Miyazaki and, and Mike Judge and Steven Hillenberg and uh, Marjane Satrapi and, and Tim Burton and Wes Anderson said, guys, just you know, explain your world to me. But the more I got into it, the more I just recently did a, a Blue Sky, spent a day at Blue Sky Studios for the Peanuts movie. And I love watching the people who are, whether they're doing the rigging, whether they're working on model, whether they're showing me their sketchbooks of what they're doing on the side. I mean, that's to me where animation lives, where people are just creating from, from whole cloth. And we have four incredibly talented people here that it's a real pleasure to, to uh, introduce them all to you. So, um, you know, it, it's uh, first, let's, we, we have Lily Carre, right? right? So she, uh, the, the Ignatz Awards are here, and the Ignatz Awards love her because she does incredible still comics. Uh, you may know Heads or Tails, but for the last going on six years, she has done the iWorks Animation Festival, and uh, it's experimental animation. It's gonna be in Chicago, LA, and New York, and uh, she's been at the, she, her work's been at the Sundance Film Festival, Edinburgh Film Festival, and elsewhere, and she just, uh, to me, everything she does, I just love following where she's going and what she's curating as well. So uh, we uh, also have uh, next to her, Sam Spina, who's your third or fourth time here, maybe? I think you. Um, yeah, three yeah, or four. Yeah. SPXs. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, Sam is, uh, you know, I love, love following what you do uh, online. You can check out Spina Doodles and Spina Creative and uh, all, uh, just uh, amazing mini comics. Uh, and, but now what you've got going on is whole, right? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. Short You're two minutes short. And mm -hmm. so we'll talk a little bit about how now, uh, how recruiting goes on too. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So uh, we have uh, Ian, Ian McGinty who, uh, <laughs> Uh, and, and uh, you know, you, uh, what, Adventure Time, uh, Steven yeah. Universe, Bravest, Bravest, Warriors. Bravest Warriors. Kind of the whole yeah. gamut of Cartoon Network properties. Yeah, yeah. but now you've got uh, Welcome to Showside, right, which is your baby. Yeah. So, uh, we'll, and that's new, so we'll, we'll get into that. Awesome. Yeah, and with Monica, Monica Ray, we... Uh, yeah, you uh, you do fuzzy fuzzy comics, and a couple of years ago, the Penny Arcade peep guys came to me and said we we're starting this reality sh show called Strip Strip Search, and you expose yourself to the world and your talent. Yeah, <laughs> but this year on Nickelodeon, she's a uh, Harvey Beaks, and uh, it's it's amazing, and you should totally check it out. So uh, the first question I have for you guys is: I remember as a kid drawing, probably like you, I started drawing professionally at twelve. And animation seemed like this incredible leap. You know, you're drawing. And I think, Sam, you said it was like being an astronaut. It's trying to imagine, like, getting to this, this other world. Could each of you talk a bit about what is that, you know, what was your first crush in terms of comics or animation? And what was that leap like? At what point could you imagine making that leap from, from comics to animation? And whoever wants to start. Well, I guess I'll, I'll start then. Um, I, I didn't grow up reading comics, but I like loved cartoons growing up. Um, I, I mean like the old Nicktoon stuff like Rock is Modern Life and <laughs> Doug and yeah, I think once I like discovered um, indie comics and mini comics and like, you know, found out about that whole world and started making my own, it was like I could finally make my own like cartoons, I feel like, so like a one man show. Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. When I was nine, uh, three older kids lied to me, and they told me that if I stayed awake past midnight, there was a Calvin and Hobbes animated TV show. <laughs> were all your friends? Yeah, like the cruelest thing you These could do. These are cruel friends. Yeah, they were awesome guys. Friends. Yeah. They were great. Um, so I could never make it that far to stay up, because I was like, you know, I was like eight or nine years old, and I always wanted to catch this. It was like that video game persona, like where like you see the Midnight Channel and it never happens and things like that. 
So basically, I came to find out that never existed. So I got really obsessed with turning Calvin and Hobbes into a show. Yeah. So basically, that's sort of how I went from being really obsessed with the Calvin and Hobbes comics, of which like I never read superhero stuff or anything like that. Um, basically, at all, just because we didn't really like have it in the house, and we kind of lived in like a very rural kind of farm type thing. So there wasn't like a comic shop, but there was always the Sunday papers and Calvin and Hobbes. So I actually was able to what I was doing but I didn't know at the time was actually like storyboarding out how a Calvin and Hobbes animated show would work yeah and that's kind of like what it spun from and I never sent it to anybody or anything like that but that was kind of what started the whole like really obsessed with how comics and animation can tie tie together and one can lead to the other and this and that and all that all because some guys lied to me and really wow. really well, broke you know, my soul uh, i do happen to have bill watterson's private email address so if you'd like me to send him something uh i'll put it together i'll put it together right now <laughs> <laughs> i will leave this panel and go do that <laughs> so yeah and uh um, lily i guess want? i'll go um so when i was growing up uh in the 90s, my dad was doing forensic animation. Yeah. So this was early 3D, like super early, very blocky, um, kind of goofy looking. Yeah. Um, forensic animation to show a court, like how a crime was committed or something using these like, you know, like a gun is pointed like this around a corner. It's very basic stuff. But um, my dad was very enthusiastic about that and about Amiga computers and the type of animation that could be done yeah. um, with that technology at the time. Um, did so that guess, warp your sense, though? Because there's a dark narrative there, a forensic uh, animation. That, it warped me in a way that I like, maybe. Yeah, okay. um, but I think that forensic animations made my first like crush, just that enthusiasm yeah. around um, the capabilities um, and how animation was being used. Yeah. Um, but it was going to school. I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and the teachers there who taught animation made work that was all just hand drawn on paper, 12 drawings um, for every second, um, very classical methods of making animation, and these were artists made films, so just one person making the entire thing with just a stack of paper and a pen. So that was really inspiring, um, kind of in contrast to the Amiga technology and this kind of forensic 3D stuff that you could create this whole world just with paper and a pen, and that it really demystified um, what animation could be. Haven't, haven't you said your parents used to roll out the butcher paper, and so you could sit there and just draw? Yeah, they both had a graphic design You're business both artists, for a while, so yeah. there's a lot of like tools and, and early graphic design yeah. uh, utensils. So you were getting the tangible, you were getting sort of the hard drawing and the animation in two different, yeah. 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 Monica, do you, uh, do you remember your... Um, your first mm-hmm. comics or animation crush, or what inspired you? Well, this is so this is great. Um, my parents had uh, the like this compilation of like a bunch of Garfield shorts, but they were really artistic. It was like Garfield's Nine Lives or something. <laughs> yeah. And it was like a vignette about Garfield by different artists and the different lives he's lived. <laughs> so it was like way cooler than Garfield. It was. Garfield. I don't know. It was really cool, <laughs> but I was so into just like the short like vignette setup of that and just how like you could go anywhere with it like in one of them he was like a pharaoh it was cool and then i learned how to draw odie and then i just i just drew pages and pages of odie and garfield talking to each other and that's when i was like i can do this i can just keep making garfield shorts yeah i'm curious because lily you talk about your parents being encouraging like i have an artist mom who's very encouraging and uh, I know Ian, like, you're, you're, you know, in Adventure Time, of course, Marceline's dad is the soul-sucking night of sphere, you know. Yeah. But, and, and so in Welcome to Showside, the father's the, sh- the shadow king. I yeah. mean, he's evil. But you've said your own dad is like this superhero. He's battled disease, and he's just, you said he's like the greatest guy in the world. So what happened that your dad, is your dad so heroic <laughs> that you've turned to, <laughs> could you talk a little bit, just your parents' influence? Yeah, um, absolutely. I mean, like, coming, so, you know, I've always had really encouraging parents with all the art stuff I've done, which is funny because my family's Navy. Yeah. Uh, I actually grew up in Annapolis, like, not, like, not that far from here. Yeah. Um, I, li- I don't live there now, but that's where I grew up. And they were always very navy, and um, but my dad was also like a kind of a hippie too. Yeah. So I don't really know how navy and hippie combine <laughs> into like nippy, but <laughs> <laughs> you know it worked out. So they always encouraged me to be drawing and stuff like that. But with Welcome to Showside, um, what I addressed was more that well, some backstory. So this character Kit, who's the main character, 
of the animation has his father, the Shadow King, who's like the most destructive force in the universe. And basically, Kit wants to sort of reject that legacy. Yeah. And that's a lot of what I address with how, basically how do you live up to the greatness or like the expectations of your parents or your grandpa or whoever it is when, you know, like my grandfather flew Navy jets and yeah. stuff like that. And I could draw a pretty good like Hobbs, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so it was this weird, that's sort of like what, how I look at it. Yeah. Like I'm not taking a bad relationship. I'm sort of looking at uh, just, you know, how do you live up to yeah. other people's expectations? I yeah. guess it's yeah. kind of where that comes from. Yeah. So that makes sense. And I know Sam, uh, you know, I, I put uh, the Washington Post has pretty deep files that we can get on people, and you are one of the hardest people to track because <laughs> you, you're in Arizona, and then you're in Denver, uh, yeah. and then you were, uh, okay. I don't know if you were in LA and Carolina, so it felt like the Comics Witness Protection Program. <laughs> yeah. um, but it seems like, in, but like I know with Hole, you talk about growing up in Arizona. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about just growing up and maybe how your childhood and, and parents, if that affects, you know, influences totally. what you do? Yeah, um, well, my mom's like pretty crafty, and my dad's, the most like uncreative person <laughs> in the entire world. But um, so I was always kind of like, my parents think of me as like this crazy artist, like, I don't know, like freak artist kid <laughs> my whole life. I'm like, I'm just drawn like doodling weird things. But anyways, yeah, I, I grew up in Arizona and I moved when I was 15. Um, and when I moved, I moved to South Carolina. So I didn't realize how much I loved Arizona until I moved. Yeah. So I've had this weird like, romantic view of what Arizona is and whenever I go back it's like oh yeah it's just like the super hot gross desert <laughs> place but in my mind it's like this you know it's like my childhood and I like love it so much yeah. so yeah whole especially is like my love letter to Arizona I feel like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. and Monica you're I mean you're uh, you're I, I will call them autobio comics I mean do you how I mean they're they're I love reading because it's so personal. It feels like you've let down the veneer, and I don't know how fictionalized or not they are, but no. not. Okay. So what's it like? I mean, if you should totally check out Fuzzy Comics and just go back years. It's so awesome. But what is it like for you to, to, to put that out there? Was it difficult, and, or was it just sort of uh, therapeutic, or can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think, I think I'm pretty open, like, just as a person. Yeah. And usually the stuff that I put on Fuzzy Comics is, are usually things that I'm perfectly happy to tell anybody who comes up to me. And yeah. so they're just these really embarrassing stories about myself and the things that I, the situations I put myself in. So yeah. Yeah. it's, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's yeah. like talking to, you know, friends and just yeah. telling them like, oh yeah, this Saturday I, I stabbed myself with a stapler. It's no big. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get all these notes so from your friends, yeah. Well, let's try, let's see, animation-wise, if we can. So I'm going to let you guys jump in based on how, if we're able to get these to work. I guess I should jump in here and say yeah. that's a background test from Welcome okay. to Show Side. Okay. Um, that's it. That's nothing. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's. Uh, we spent a really long time uh, developing like the look of Welcome to Show Side, which is coming out um, around Halloween. Yeah. Um, for it'll be on YouTube for everybody to see. So I, just, I just, I'll just throw. It. I threw a bunch of just like okay. process animation tests for if you guys wanted to see kind of like how we developed it, um, things like that. I also voiced the main character, Kit, um, yeah. so once that comes out, so that was a really interesting yeah. Uh, experience. But yeah, so I just threw some stuff in there, so whatever you want to fire up, just okay. just Will go you, for it. I don't know if it's in any order. Will okay. you do the voice for us? That's pretty much me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, do, we talk a little bit about Kit. I mean, you did, did you think about having anyone else voice, or you're like, no, I, I've got to be we, Kit? I, we auditioned a bunch of people. Um, and you want to tell him he's a monster kid. Yeah, basically. he's like this little demon kid, basically. The, yeah. the, the elevator pitch for Welcome to Show Side has always been like Steven Universe meets Hellboy. 
yeah. which is been, which I think it rocks to, to yeah. when you tell somebody that personally. I was like, yeah. I spent more time on that sentence than I did, I think, on the whole show. <laughs> um, but yeah, essentially, he's he's this demon boy, and he lives in this town called Showside, and he has these two best friends, um, Belle, who is the youngest daughter of this family of very, I live in Savannah, Georgia, very genteel southern like monster hunters. Yeah. She's not supposed to be friends with monsters. And then her other best friend is uh, Moon, who is the uh, great granddaughter of like the most famous sorceress in the world or whatever. And yeah. so the idea is that, like that background test you just saw is this area called the Nexus, where all the demons come from. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that monsters obtain work visas to work in Showside, mm -hmm. um, essentially. So that's, it's this, the one town in America where like monsters and humans kind of live and operate together. And sometimes there's good ones and sometimes there's bad ones. Yeah. So that's basically, yeah. yeah. So, um, and yeah, for, for, uh, for Kit's voice, uh, we auditioned a bunch of people and none of them worked. And then we had 30 minutes left to, of studio time. And I said, I'll just go in and do it. And it ended up being great. So, and you're set. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, we wanted John Omohundro from Bravest Warriors, but he was working on something way cooler than this, so <laughs> we couldn't get that. But uh, it worked out really well. Yeah. And then we got, uh, the biggest was we got Henry Rollins to voice yeah. um, this character, Frank, who's a demon um, that's basically a giant skull with nerd glasses on that yeah. catches on fire from time to time. So, yeah, we really lucked out. Like, it really rocked. It's been a really cool so experience. did your dad, like, manage the Nighthawks or... Yeah, 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 yeah he briefly. Because Henry Rollins is a... Not only, I mean, he's not everywhere, but he's locally, like, a hero. Yeah, you it's, know? it's pretty... It was, like, you know, you see the guy, and he's this big, you know, muscular dude. And yeah. For me, you know, I'm, like, five feet tall, so I was a little intimidated, but... He was like the kindest, most generous guy I've ever met in my entire life, and yeah. he was more than happy to nice. to do it. And he loved the care. He just liked this flaming skull yeah. guy. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it rocked. And that that was just kind of like a happy coincidence. And he basically he wanted to be involved just because he liked it, yeah. which that was a hugely flattering. Because you know I was like, well, who am I to Henry Rollins? Probably yeah. nobody really. But yeah, and now, and now yeah. you're friends. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. Well, I'm going to see. I'm hoping we have sound. Let's see if we can get the, the iWorks one to file. And do we have sound, DJ? We don't. Okay. Well, then um, I'm going to ask Lily to talk about, this is from your festival. And yeah, this is our trailer from last year. So just kind of imagine your own mental soundtrack <laughs> to these pieces. It's a compilation of um, different work that we showed at the festival. Um, oh, wow. So... It shows a, a range of styles, and it kind of has more of an oomph when there's when there's sound going. But um, so this is a festival uh, that I've done. This will be our sixth year. Uh, I do it with my partner in yeah. Chicago, and then we do it at Alexander other Stewart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. um, who's also an animator yeah. and um, yeah, collaborator. Um, and we focus on experimental animation. Mm -hmm. um, we really felt like there was. Um, Oh, maybe sound will happen. Uh, that there was a gap um, between festivals of places to see this certain kind of work that we were seeing being made, um, where in more traditional animation festivals, um, maybe it leans more towards character-based, more straightforward narrative work. Um, and um, then also in experimental film festivals, you have uh, Maybe it's muted. Did
Okay. Ooh, so that's. Nice. <laughs> You might, so, you might want to pause it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's, you gotta uh, in case people get sick okay. of it. Um, so could you talk about, you know, what is it like curating this festival? Because I know you, you have a deep cinematic knowledge. Right? You've talked about filmmakers from, no, from the 30s that influenced you. And you cast a wide net, and we see so many styles, so many techniques here. What is it, as you've built the festival over years, you know, what, what are you, lo are you looking for individual voices, you know, uh, artistic voices? What are you looking for when you curate this? Mm. Well, so yeah, um, we do definitely try and show a range of work, as you can see from the techniques here, um, and also work that um, is, you know, from a lot of different countries and yeah. places. Um, and work that really feels like it, it doesn't fit into animation festivals and doesn't fit into experimental film festivals. Yeah. Um, there's just a certain quality to the films that's hard to put your finger on yeah. um, that we really wanted to give a venue. And we did want to pair new works um, that people are making right now and just popping up online with um, classic works that are sitting in film archives on 16 millimeter that are important experimental animation films that people don't really see that much. So we wanted to pair, you know, a new student film from Estonia with, you know, a classic CalArts 70s film by Jules Engel or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, and then also we are interested in, in like Fleischer animation too, which is more studio stuff, but just to speak to the history of animation and sort of compare different films to each other. Yeah. Do you feel like it's still underrepresented here, or do you feel like access is growing to, to, to seeing experimental, in this country, seeing experimental animation? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly online. So many people are making it and just yeah. putting it immediately yeah. online um, and kind of circumventing any festival yeah. presence, and you can just have so many more eyeballs on it, like yeah. thousands and thousands of eyeballs. Um, and so that's really exciting to have that kind of community and access to work. Um, but I do think that there's something really important about also having a social setting for something like that. And kind of similar to SPX, where people work on their comics, it's this very labor-intensive thing. Usually it's the, the vision of a single artist. Um, and there is something really amazing about having this object that can travel on its own and that people can encounter in different places. But there's also something really important about having a place where you can meet the people and have this face-to-face -face, um, and talk about the technique and the work and just have a sort of a, a shared sort of social setting. So to be able to see some of these films in a theater yeah. um, and also see these comparisons and, and have this physical space devoted to this kind of animation, I think, um, we saw as, as lacking, so we wanted to, to make something yeah. around that. Well, you talk about the social setting. SPX draws so many, you know, let's face it, as cartoonists, aspiring cartoonists, aspiring animators. If they were to come to your table and say, you know, or come to, to a festival and say, what, I, I have a film in mind, but what are you looking, I know it's a broad question, but if they said, what are you looking for? You know, what sort of parameters or what would you say to them if they're coming as a creator or an aspiring creator? I wouldn't want them to make anything to fit yeah. a certain parameter. I mean, in general, we like things that feel very um, kind of raw in a certain way. Not that it graphically has to look raw, but yeah. that it's definitely like you can see how much human time went into this yeah. thing yeah. Of, of a single person. Yeah. Um, and again, similar to a comic, you can like feel how much of that person is in it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's this sort of exciting quality to seeing these films. And yeah. also people who are experimenting and thinking about different ways to use animation that, yeah. um, that is less established. Okay, very cool. Well, let's see if we can get sound on, on another one. So. Okay. Want to get to, um, if we can get, this is, uh, this is Harvey Beek's certified babysitter. <laughs> oh, it's just going to keep looping. So, so Monica, could you talk about uh, talk about uh, you know this, you know what this this you storyboard this, you write this, and I mean you and you and Nick, right, do this, and uh, I mean I love if to get into the story uh, as a babysitter, he has to babysit an egg, right, a little egg. 
and he rolls around, and while Jeremy, we see there, is babysitting him. And uh, I, I know with at least a couple of your episodes, homes tend to either flood or burn down or something like that. <laughs> things, bad things happen. But um, part of what I, I love is so much about animation is a take on childhood. And Harvey, to me, seems like the idealized child, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have twins involved here who are the opposite, who are the rule breakers. Could you talk a little bit about these characters and the, the tension between the characters and what it's like to storyboard for, the, for these characters? Sure, well, um, Carl Greenblatt is the one who created Harvey Weeks. Um, if you're familiar with him, he also created Chowder that ran on Cartoon Network for a little while. Um, and what you described is pretty much exactly what he put into the show. Yeah. It's, it's his, you know, it's very, it's very much like a throwback to childhood. Um, he sees himself as this kid, Harvey, who's mm -hmm. just this perfect boy who just loves his parents and loves his friends and loves going to bed on time and cleaning his room. <laughs> um, and his two best friends are these feral um, forest children who grew up with no parents and they're dirty and it's just an interesting contrast, but they're friends and they push each other in yeah. different directions. Um, and boarding for them is really, fun because um, Carl is just really supportive of what we do with the characters yeah. um, and we always we always like to add dimensions to their personality wherever we can yeah so I'm pretty sure that in this one we have like a bunch of jokes about Harvey like listening to audiobooks and just the things he does <laughs> that you don't see off screen that adds to who he is yeah um, but yeah um, Harvey Beaks is a board-driven show, which is a little bit different than script-driven. So we write, the board artists, me and Nick, we write all the dialogue, yeah. and then the general synopsis of the show is given to us in an outline. Um, so we have a lot of creative control over what the characters are like and how, how their lines are delivered. Yeah. Could you guys talk a little bit about, uh, most fellow cartoonists I know, part of the reason you, you go into still comics is because there's a, you, you're a creative control freak. You know, you get to control, you get to be actor, director, everything. But uh, like you and Nick with this, you have to, you work in tandem, you, you, you know, with even within the larger structure of a show. Could you talk a little bit about that dynamic creatively? Um, yeah, well working with Nick is great. Like yeah. he and I get along really well and we both have very similar sensibilities when it comes to writing. Um, so it's always easy to bounce ideas off each other and sort of steer the characters in the episode in the right direction. But ultimately, the, um, the creative control and then the, the final like feeling of the show and the characters is up to Carl. Yeah. So he'll always check in and tell us, like, oh, Harvey is being too mean here. Fee is too bitchy. Take that line away. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, yeah. Very yeah. cool. It's very, it's very collaborative. Yeah. And do you prefer that, or do you like to be able to go back and forth to? Mm -hmm. I think I like the workflow that we have on Beaks. It's, yeah. it's very positive, um, and everyone's really nice. Um, and it's really good for like bouncing ideas off of each other. But then I think there's like a selfish part of every artist that sort of wants to you yeah. know, do what they do and only that. Yeah, <laughs> so. very cool. Well, let's. Make sure to get to welcome to show sign. Let's see what we got. That's just the still. Yeah. These Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. More? Well, yeah. so basically, oh, what, what this is, and this is my fault because I literally just threw like everything that we I happen to have on me at the time <laughs> in <laughs> here. But basically, like what we're doing is we are producing. Um, the pilot, like as we speak, yeah. um, right now, yeah. and then also the comic, and, and we're doing it in tandem with each other. And the other. comic comes out next month. And the comic, actually, the the pilot will be, it, you'll be able to see it literally the day before the comic comes out. Okay. So we're doing everything kind of side by side, and these are some of these are just elements of like the actual pilot, you know, just some really basic stuff. Um, and essentially, what I'm doing is not only did I will create it, but and design basically everything for the animated thing. I'm also the lead artist and writer on the comic as well. Yeah. So it's a lot. So there's a lot of stuff going on. Like yeah. that's my best image, for yeah. example. <laughs> uh, that's my best work. <laughs> right there. Okay. 
Um, yeah, so we so what we did is we've got the comic coming out through Z2 Comics, um, and that's going to be in tandem with the pilot. It's really great because we're getting in, I'm getting to involve a lot of comic artists on the pilot, yeah. which has been great. Um, and so some you're seeing some pages here just from stuff. Sal, the colors all messed up, but whatever. Yeah. Um, so again, this is Z2 yeah. Comics, Josh Frankel. Z2 Comics, uh, welcome to Showside. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that'll be out soon. There's some like designs from the animation, some stills. Um, things like that. It's been a blast, but I've been able to include like Kate Leth, who were you know we worked on Bravest Warriors together yeah. on the comic, and yeah. she's one of my best friends, and so she's doing some stuff for us, and we've it's just been really great. Like we've, I've gotten to involve comic people in, yeah. and I do think they kind of go hand in hand. Like to me, yeah. it wasn't that it was just the that was a very simple thing to do. Yeah. Um, like for example, two of our designers, Meg and Fred over there. If you want to put your hands up, they yeah. They are, uh, they're comic artists. Fred, Fred works with me on the Munchkin comic series yeah. that I do as well. Um, and then he does a ton of stuff for Boom. And then Meg also did a Steven Universe book with me. Yeah. And basically they're like good friends of mine. So yeah. I said, why not like involve them with the show? So yeah. basically they're just doing design stuff for us. Um, Fred in particular designed the Teen Nomicon, which is the teenage Necronomicon. Yeah. So it's just like this angsty, <laughs> terrible, like, <laughs> you know, horrible book or whatever. Um, but it's great. So yeah, I just took like comic friends and yeah. and uh, I'll be and I'll be completely honest. too, I've hired people based off of like fan art that they've done. Nice. Um, and put put them with stuff. You know, like I'm really into, you know, involving people who just love art and comics and yeah. and, and animation and just yeah. sort of like getting them, you know, into it. Yeah. It's like. As long as you're not a total jerk, like I think we'll yeah. be all right. You know? so, so if you've got your fan art out there, yeah. go go to it on Twitter is Ian McGinty or you know and uh, w you know the cool thing too is I know Penn Ward with Adventure Time. Yes. Adventure Time's been so great. I've seen people who are exhibiting here, tabling, and next thing I know they're doing art for Adventure Time, working on a comic. Uh, Rebecca Sugar, Steven Universe tabled here as a teenager and uh, you know was doing her mini comics and next thing we know she's the the first uh, the network's first solo female showrunner so you know that leap it's amazing. you could it's it's the community seems so tight once you're you know in that yeah, world yeah and I think that's really important too I mean I think that's yeah. like definitely what I mean it's so you know it's obvious to say like of course mm -hmm. everybody being involved but it is a really does become a tight knit thing, and if you can get into that community, it's like yeah, just incredible, you know. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna ask you, Sam, to help me find. Oops. Hold <laughs> up here. <laughs> and Sorry, yeah, I think I sent it to you. I don't have the digital files. Yeah. Yeah, nobody wants to see that for. <laughs> and do you see it up here? Do you, do you have do we need internet? A no, I don't think it's. I don't think it's in there. It's not. We can just talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, so yeah. I, so I, so I mean, uh, what it's really cool. It's about two minutes, and I'll just is an impressionistic yeah. thing because yeah. it's it's really cool. Where you know you're a kid and you're digging that always idea. If I keep digging, where will I get? And so suddenly you have under the 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 neighbor's yard, you have this cool. You know, it's almost like if you had your your coolest tree fort underground, the subterranean thing. And they're all hanging out. But next thing you know, you got the evil neighbor, right? Putting water in this. Now, what that gets to is, I mean, this is two minutes. And you have to put months and months, nine, uh, I mean, you know, months and months. Yeah. And you pitch, I guess what I'm curious about is one, the pitch uh -huh. to, for, for two minutes yeah. and that process. And then what it's like to put all that time into two minutes. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I just. I mean, I come from this, like mini comics and stuff, and I just happened to meet um, somebody from Nickelodeon at Ape in San Francisco, and she told me about the Nickelodeon Shorts program, which is here right now. Every, everybody can like submit to that. It's just like open pitching. Um, that you just yeah. Can we state that story? I mean, you can say, say it better than I. I mean, like, like it's not just a SPX. I mean, they're they're looking for talent, right? Yeah, definitely. And they, I mean, they're at every big show like this, yeah. like yeah. scooping up comics and finding new people and stuff. And that's how it happened with me. And they, yeah. um, I was just in talk with her for, I mean, a couple email conversations. And I uh, pitched her one thing, and she was, it was a, about bugs. And they were like, oh, we're not really looking for bug things right now. So then I <laughs> uh, pitched them whole. Um, yeah, and it was, I didn't know anything about uh, animation really. I didn't, 
it was, and it was just like a, such an awesome backstage pass of the whole process from start to finish. Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, working on two minutes. It's like a good, solid chunk to start with. And yeah. now, um, now I work for a regular show, yeah. and it's like Harvey Beaks, board driven. Yeah. And I've learned a ton from that. I've been on that for a year. Yeah. And Hole is still in development at Nickelodeon, and now I can bring like everything I've learned from working on a regular show and actually be more hands on with Hole now because. Um, the short, I didn't storyboard it, yeah. but um, yeah. I'm getting to work on some potential boards and stuff yeah. for it now. So. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for e each of you, I'm curious, could you talk about, there is, we know with comics making, we know with animation, there's a, there's a, there's a tedium to it that I think people don't realize. I mean, <laughs> you, you just hours and hours that you pour into it. And at the end result, you know, it's it's this long, especially if you're if it's something you're you're doing yourself or the one other person. Um, I mean, could could you just each talk a little bit about, you know, what 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 drives you, what 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 inspires you to put this many hours into something, you know, because uh, you know whether it's a, a a graphic novel or an, or an, you know an animation. I mean, you really you know most of the effort is not seen as it were. Could you each talk about that, Lily? Do you want to? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that it's it's definitely a lot of labor and a yeah. lot of alone time. But there's just something about actually making an animation and drawing it just from the stack of paper that seeing your drawings come to life, yeah. it's such a pleasure and such a weird novelty and yeah. excitement that it, it always makes it feel worth it and to get to put sound to it and get to see people watching it. Yeah. I mean, it's the same, I think, uh, this feeling of having your comic that you've been working on for months or years printed as like a thing and watch someone read it or know that it's out there. There's this real like satisfaction that comes out of that. Yeah. Um, I think for animation, what is nice in contrast to working on comics and that being a really uh, laborious thing is that each drawing doesn't really matter yeah. at all. Because yeah. um, if you're doing 12 for every second, um, you can just not be precious with anything. Yeah. And it's about this accumulation of drawings and the movement. And um, that's really freeing, I think, as a drawer and as a cartoonist. And I think that actually taught me how to be um, a cartoonist because I did animation before I did comics oh. that, to like really reduce what you want to draw and yeah. really get that certain quality out of very few marks. Yeah. Um, does that make you any less precious if you're drawing wood, Woodsman Pete? I mean, does it transfer over to your other comics or are you in a different mindset with that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the reason I switch, or not the reason, but one of the reasons that I enjoy switching back and forth is that after doing so many drawings, to like hundreds to have someone go like this. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it feels really great to just draw one drawing of someone going like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think they kind of relieve each other in yeah. a certain way. Yeah. Um, but I do feel like um, I really honed my sense of how to draw characters and the world I wanted from yeah. animation yeah. and from that process. Yeah, and to, on that same question, but Sam, I know you, like you were a graphic designer in college, you were studying and then suddenly yeah. you discover comics and the love of the wobbly line or the yeah. unstraight line and, you know, could you talk a little bit about that? For sure, yeah, I've, I've always been like, I've always kept sketchbooks and stuff like yeah. that, but like I said, I never read comics yeah. just because I associated that with superheroes and stuff. Um, so I went to school for graphic design because it seemed practical and I like, I really fell in love with um, graphic design. It's like this um, combination of art and like logical problem solving that I really like. Um, and then I discovered mini comics and started making my own. And it was like so freeing um, because it's like after doing like crummy freelance design stuff <laughs> and having to answer to like stupid clients that don't know what they're talking about. It's so <laughs> nice to just like draw comics and nobody can tell me what to do. I can do whatever I want and. If I draw it bad, it's like it's because I want to, and yeah. nobody can tell me not to, and stuff. Yeah. Um, and also, it's like it's kind of like cheesy to say, but it's like when I, it's my way of like communicating. I feel like it's like my voice comics. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, animation is just like the next step to where I can like feel like I can like share my ideas with more people. It's just yeah. a bigger audience, but I come at it from the same way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, with my own stuff. I, I guess regular show, I'm not really, it's it's a little less so, and I, I still make comics to make up for the fact that I'm like answering to other people. But yeah. 
Yeah. Well, and Ian, so you get to be the boss now. So you get to, <laughs> do you prefer to order people around or be off by yourself making your comments? Or is it that same balance? I mean, where you get to I mean, go I back love to yell at people. But, <laughs> uh, well, it's interesting because, like, so for me, I kind of came into it backwards, which was I started working on licensed properties, yes. which were monthly books, like Bravest Warriors and Adventure Time. So you're always drawing on model, exactly, licensed properties. Exactly. So that's yeah. kind of like what, it's funny because I haven't actually worked in actually animating, but yeah. I've worked on tons of stuff that it's pretty much the same concept where I need to stay completely on model and on, you know, using the style guide, which is how you follow how the character looks from it. And then the thing was that I was, since they're monthly books, it's like you just kind of, you do it and, and it's out there and it's done. It's a very quick thing yeah. um, as opposed to like with, I mean, I've been staring at a six minute long pitch for like two years. Wow. You know what I mean? Wow. So it's a completely different thing to be like, yeah, Finn and Jake do this thing. And then they go, you know, like Steven and they do this thing. And then it's like, does that look right? Well, that eye's a little this way. So, you know, it's a very different um, kind of way to go about things. But it's also very natural to me, I think, because of sort of what trained me to also look out for, um, I guess, what was appealing to me and what I wanted from an animated thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'm, it kinda, I kind of go all over the place, but I guess it was like coming from having the knowledge about sort of, you know, how the licensed properties worked and how, you know, Penn kind of like, you know, pitches things. I don't know if you guys have ever seen the original uh, Adventure Time uh, uh, pitch, not the not the pilot, but the pitch, but yeah. it's like drawn out on napkins and stuff like yeah. that. But it's still, you, could, you can look at it and you go, man, that's... Like that's a really cool, unique you thing. Can, can see um, so I was really lucky to be able to kind of see the glory of like you know how awesome the comics are, and then in tandem you know with the show and things yeah. like that. So I kind of took what I learned from the comics and then applied it to the animation stuff. Yeah. And like Monica, do you find it going back and forth doing an autobiography comic or in Harvey Beaks? Do you find that you know your own work? I mean, you're sort of. It, where you have total control and then doing the other, do you, is that balance kind of uh, feeds you creatively or? Yeah, it, it totally does. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had as much time since I started to do my autobio yeah. comic, um, but whenever I do get the chance to do it, it's very therapeutic. Um, but I think, and I think that's what makes the hours that go into doing our art go by so quickly is because when we're done, <laughs> it's like, this personal piece of our soul that we've manifested for people to see. And it's, it's a little bit different than like designing a pamphlet for a client <laughs> in two weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Well, uh, I wanted to open it up to the floor because I know we have some diehard fans out there. So, uh, questions? Let's go ahead. Yes? Um, Monica, what I wanted to ask is on your Tumblr, some of them you do a lot of fan art. And I wanted to know if you think how fandom sort of either inspires or breeds future animators or artists and whatnot. Mm, do you mean like, do you mean like as an artist, like does being a fan of something <coughs> contribute to you growing as like a yeah sort of, yeah kind of yeah I mean I think so I. I do Steven Universe fan art. I draw fan art of like, Pokemon and stuff all the time. And <laughs> honestly, that stuff makes up most of my Tumblr. Um, and I really do think there's merit in like, you know, being a fan of something and then producing work that shows that you're a fan of something. You know, I, I think that there's definitely growth there. Um, if that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyone? No. Well, I, you know, I want to get a little, oh, yes, right there. Um, I mean, you want to uh, go ahead? Yeah, yeah, I would say that if, that, no, I don't think you need to have some kind of like bar that you've reached of like, well, now I can draw a human head in all directions. I'm ready to pitch. I think most important when you're pitching an idea to a studio is 
having an idea, like knowing what your idea is very thoroughly so that whenever questions come up about characters and settings and things, you know the answers to them. Um, if you go into an idea that's sort of like half there, then the other half is going to be built while you're making it, which is not a bad thing, but it's like, you know, it's helpful if you know in your own head what your, what your idea is. Mm -hmm. And did we have right here? Like I'm really good at like self-imposed deadlines. Um, yeah, just like making a plan and sticking to it. Yeah. Or giving yourself some kind of uh, constraints. Yeah. I mean, uh, and does does routine help? I've always heard like you know if you can train your brain like I need to be creative around this time every day, or do you have triggers or things that help you? I mean, schedules are definitely oh, it's yeah. de definitely something that'll always yeah. help you for sure. I mean, it's kind of. Um, you know, I meet a lot of artists who are a little kind of more like freewheeling yeah. um, and things like that. And um, life is really distracting yeah. in general. I mean, like, dude, have you seen the PS? When's the PS5 coming out, man? Yeah, like, you know right. I mean? Like, there's so much cool stuff going on all the time. But yeah, I find that definitely like schedules. I mean, like me personally, I make sure I'm always starting work at, I'll lie and say 9 o'clock. Usually it ends up being like 11.30. But I usually try to be doing stuff as early in the day as possible, and then I have a set time when I'm done. And I yeah. find that my brain, my creativity, like kind yeah. of, you know, has, will turn on for that amount of time and turn off, and then I just shut off basically all, like kind of creative output after a certain amount of time of the day, because you can get burnt out. And I think what you're talking about as well, with all the doodling and stuff, is that it sounds like you have a lot of ideas, but, you don't, but you're saying you don't know what to like fall on. That naturally comes. Like, that's not something you can schedule. That's not something that you can, that'll just, you know, you'll go, oh, that's perfect. That's going to make me like a million dollars, which will also never happen, by the way. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't think, I think that you'll hit on something that you will find interesting, and you'll start asking yourself more questions about what that is. Like, for example, um, for a show side, I just had, I started with Kit as this character, yeah. and I drew, he was a little monster kid in line with these other huge monsters. Scary looking monster. Yeah. And then my head was like, well, what's up with this? Like, why is that? Why is he a little kid? And I drew it, so I don't even know why I was asking myself that question. But I think you'll I heard it was Hellboy like meets. Uh, yeah, Steve. exactly. You know, and I was like, oh, so I wonder what his story is. And I think naturally you'll hit something where you'll go, I want to know the other stories behind the drawing, if that makes sense. That's what we should have called this panel. Yeah. Behind the drawing. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I, I also think that um, maybe just make a lot of bad things yeah. like don't put so much pressure on waiting for this one idea that feels really right but just like work through stuff and know it's bad and then have the comfort of knowing that there isn't that pressure on yourself and then maybe it'll be good and maybe it'll be 100 bad things until you do make something yeah, like, that feels the, really it's right it's like the, you're, you'll draw like a million terrible things before yeah. you draw like one thing I one good thing Chuck, and I think Ju there's Chuck a Jones the old Bugs Bunny guy used to say you know to my terrorists you have 20,000 bad drawings yeah. and you get to the, expel them as quickly as possible yeah. And I think, yeah, and there's, like, there's an audience for your bad ideas. Like, people will love, <laughs> I'm serious, like, people will love seeing, like, this one thing that you spit out, and they're like, what is that? And you're like, I don't know, I drew it eight years ago. Like, why are you still looking at it? I guess it's like, <laughs> don't, like, don't cater to an audience, I guess. Sure. Also, it was, like, That's kind of that thing, like, do stuff for yourself, too. Yeah. You know. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much. Yeah. Um, in terms of if you're like really looking to fall on like one thing, um, yeah, just see what comes naturally, and then add peer pressure. Because if you start putting things out there and then people are expecting you to update, then it's like, oh great, now I have to. <laughs> I have no choice. Outsider deadlines, mm. yeah. And it sounds like each, the four of you, each have strong internal sensors and voices, not just creatively. I mean, what what you gravitate toward. Is that fair to say? Either that or someone close to you who says, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, any 
Anyone? Yes, right here. Yeah, well, I did. A, oh, sorry. No, go for it. I was just gonna say I don't. I I get to tell the board people what to do. So yeah, so, yeah. It's all you guys. <laughs> I've only done. A, I did a board test for a regular show like three years ago and didn't hear anything back until last year. So it's just. I guess if you like do a bunch of them, like don't give up hope if they don't get back to you right away. But. Yeah. Um, I did. Oh, sorry. I, I did the Harvey Beaks board test um, coming from comics, and I'll say that. Uh, it was, it was interesting and fun, but I learned a lot because I'm used to comics. I'm used to not drawing like ten poses of one action, yeah. so I had to go back and do a lot of edits to my test before it was ready. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's our time. I just want to say, make sure uh, seriously to check out Harvey Beaks and Fuzzy Comics online, definitely, and Monte on Twitter, Monterey. Yeah, and uh, make sure to check out Welcome to Showside, both in print and, uh, and when we get to see the animation, definitely. Yeah. Check out Regular Show, check out Hole, which you can see it, <laughs> and check out the iWorks Festival, and check out Heads or Tails, because it's amazing, and just, you know, we have four amazing creators. Follow their work, and uh, go forward. Thank you, guys.